You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome, my friends. Welcome to episode 45 of The Corbett Report. P-Tech and the 9-11 software. Today's episode features information that comes from corporate whistleblower Indira Singh. Regular listeners to the Corbett Report might remember Indira Singh from episode 31, Welcome to 9-11 Truth. In that audio documentary, we featured a clip from Indira Singh's presentation to the Citizens Commission on 9-11. That clip featured some of Indira Singh's startling testimony about the information that she gleaned when she was working at J.P. Morgan Chase. Singh was hired as a consultant for J.P. Morgan Chase to develop the next generation of business architecture enterprise software. The software she was seeking to implement at J.P. Morgan Chase, one of the largest financial institutions in the world, was specialized cutting-edge risk architecture software that would essentially be artificially intelligent and capable of scanning through the millions of transactions taking place across the J.P. Morgan Chase institution in real time, monitoring these transactions for suspicious activity such as rogue trading, and would then be able to alert the proper people within the J.P. Morgan institution to the problem, and potentially even stop the transactions from taking place. The importance, sensitivity, and sophistication of any such software necessarily led Ms. Singh to seek out the true leaders in the enterprise architecture software industry. Her research and due diligence into the issue led her to a company called p As the senior risk management consultant for one of the largest financial institutions in the world, Ms. Singh knew to trust credible, proven sources of third-party software. That's why p roster of clients immediately put them in the top echelon of software providers. P-TECH's clients included some of the most sensitive organizations and agencies in the United States government, including NATO, the U.S. Armed Forces, Congress, the Department of Energy, the Department of Justice, the FBI, Customs, the FAA, the IRS, the Secret Service, and the White House. This sterling roster of clients made Indira Singh very eager to take a look at P-TECH's software. However, when the P-TECH representatives arrived at the J.P. Morgan Chase offices to display and present their software, Miss Singh knew there was something wrong right away. Today we're going to do something that we haven't done since episode 20 of the Corbett Report, which featured a presentation by Webster Tarpley on the 9-11 drills. Regular listeners to the Corbett Report will remember Webster Tarpley's lecture from episode 20, on the 26 war games and drills that Webster Tarpley has identified as taking place on or around 9-11 that directly affected the U.S. Air Force's ability to counteract the hijackings that day. That was one of the key talks to get people into the deep research through which they can come to a more informed understanding of the operational aspects of 9-11 as an inside job. Likewise, the interview that we're about to present with Indira Singh gives a more informed, more detailed account of what was really taking place on 9-11 and the software that was used to help bring that about. This is an extremely important interview for anyone interested in the serious, deep research into 9-11 and is an excellent starting point from which to begin a deeper investigation of that day. I heartily recommend that my listeners check out this interview in its entirety. And again, please go to the documentation list on corporatereport.com for a link to the original source file of this audio interview so you can listen to it in its entirety. Today I present an extended audio extract from this interview conducted by Bonnie Faulkner of KPFA's Guns and Butter in 2005. This extract begins with Indira Singh explaining what happened when p arrived in her office. Well, they came a little late. Immediately, there were some issues with how the day would proceed. For instance, they showed up without the agreed-on software in hand. 
the most important thing about it is that their chief scientist, Dr. Hussein Ibrahim, came. He's an Egyptian-American, and he had a, a very good reputation in the field, very bright, someone you would like working with very knowledgeable, but they had showed up without the software. And what I had done was isolated a workstation to get off the net. After all, we were testing uh, whether the software would meet our criteria. And if I had said it did, then that would be a big deal if it subsequently couldn't. So I needed to start with an out-the-box version of PTAC. They didn't bring that, and Dr. Abraham said, that's not a problem. We can develop the demo on his laptop. And if you know anything about these things, that's like a no-no, because at the end of the day, he's walking out the door, and I don't have anything. And he's walking away with pretty much enough of how we're thinking about doing operational risk. Now, operational risk is about how to spot bad things that are going on in a financial institution, things like rogue trading, money laundering, and so on and so forth. And it's very subtle. Our intellectual property, at least what J.P. Morgan was hiring me for, was to think innovatively out of the box in the next generation. How do you proactively design a blueprint to spot these things? And that's pretty big. He's definitely, people are smart enough to get an idea. Oh, they're thinking of going down this road. That's a big deal. So I was a risk person, so I'm very aware of not to expose our intellectual property or that of the company I am consulting for. I'm very protective of that. So they showed up without the software, and um, that was a huge enough red flag that I began paying attention to them. A couple other things went on, and within half an hour, I just walked over to the same people who had recommended them and began calling, and I said to one of them, I have the PTAC people here, and the reaction was not the reaction I would have ever expected. It was, what are they doing on site? And I said, well, you recommended them. And they said, no, um, you should have come through a distributor, an American distributor. And I said, uh-uh, J.P. Morgan reserves the right to work directly with the company, and besides which they are a preferred vendor of IBM, their preferred vendor program, and that's the way we work. We don't work through small distributors. If we're going to go with this software as a standard, we're going to go right to the source and make the agreements there. So I said, what is the problem? And uh, basically this person said, don't let them out of your sight. And that's when my stomach sank. So you have to understand how all of a sudden I'm beginning to see these people in a different way. Because when they said, don't let them out of your sight, I have a Middle Eastern company there. And we're taught not to discriminate. And that was not something that I was about to do. And uh, to prove that they were there being evaluated. So that is never uh, you know, going to be a bone of contention. Although later people made that an issue. But if I had a problem working with a Middle Eastern company, they would have never been there in the first place, much less before Ground Zero closed. And no problem whatsoever having them up there. I like the idea. What do you mean uh, PTEC was a Middle Eastern company? Well, that's what subsequently was revealed in the phone call, that their financier, their funders, their investors were all Saudis. And I said so. What? Um, and they said, one Saudi has been placed on the U.S. terror list October 12, 2001. And I said, um, it got very quiet. I said, you better have proof of that because having thrown that into my lap now, this is not something that I can ignore. I have to follow up on it. This is not something I can ignore or pretend would go away or have someone else handle. This is risk management, the highest levels of one of the largest banks in the world. It is my responsibility to deal with this. And I said, how can I get proof of this? And that's when they started saying, you need to talk to Jeff Goins, who was one of the only three people in PTEC who knew of this relationship. You see, it was that well hidden within PTEC. And so I subsequently called Jeff Goins and I said, well, if this is true, did you not report this? PTEC is a private company, so this relationship would have been privy only to those on the inside. I said, did you report it anywhere that someone 
who has been placed on the U.S. terror list, is key funder, angel investor to a company whose software is utilized at the highest levels of almost every government and military and defense organization in this country, including the Secret Service, the FBI, the Department of Defense, the House of Representatives, the Treasury Department, the IRS, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Air Force, and last but not least, the Federal Aviation Administration. Are you saying these were all P-TECH clients? These were all P-TECH clients, and when I was evaluating them, I was pretty impressed. Why not P-TECH? Exactly. They're being used at the highest levels of all of these organizations. So I was very excited about using them and having their software be able to be at the heart of what I wanted to develop. And I had no reason to believe that if they were in use everywhere at that caliber, that I would have a problem. They're also used in Enron, perhaps... I should have thought twice about that, but um, they're at use in IBM, of course, and the top accounting firms, and even in the FBI, in MITRE. What is MITRE? MITRE is a large company that does specialized technology for defense and intelligence. You would not expect to have an exposure with a company that was so well entrenched and embedded in these kinds of organizations. So what about the meeting? Then did they leave? Just what no, happened? because um, basically my position was until I had proof, I could not react. That would have been very unprofessional of me. And so I thought of a number of scenarios that could be going on at that point. I thought it might have been, you know, competitiveness, out of control, distributors wanting the J.P. Morgan account. It could have been anything in However, the one thing that was true is that the chief investor, uh, Sheikh Yassin Qadi, was indeed placed on the U.S. terror list because while I was talking to them, while they were still there, I checked out a website that had a list of everyone who had been placed on the terror list. The missing piece was, of course, proving that Sheikh Yassin Qadi was indeed affiliated with PTEC, was an owner of PTEC because it was a private company. And you could say that anybody was a investor, any bad guy or good guy was an investor. Proving it was another thing. So I let everything ride, but I kept an eye on things. And in fact, we did have a presentation that went very, very well because in no way, shape or form was I going to jeopardize that. So what happened next? Did you go on working with them or did you start to investigate PTEC? Well, I continued multitasking. I was working with them. I placed a few phone calls and people got back to me later that day while they were still on premises. So I was able to separate the concerns, accomplish the task, evaluate the software anyway, start the phone calls to start getting more information. Then my report would have been, this is the software, it's used everywhere, it can do what we want it to do. However, we have this issue with the company and present that to my superiors and let them decide. Then did you start investigating the company? Yes. What happened next was um, I spoke with Jeff Goins, and he told me that basically not only was Yasin Kadi uh, was an investor, but that a Jakub Mertza was on the board of directors, and he had been the subject of Operation Green Quest. Many of his Herndon, Virginia vehicles and companies and financing companies had been raided in March 2002. And again, that uh, Mertza was on the board of directors. As we spoke, other names started to come out. My head was pretty much spinning at this point, and I said, have you reported any of this to the FBI? And the answer came back, yes. So I wrote a report to the FBI, and um, I said, okay, if the Boston FBI has been told, I need to speak with people there, because it's not just my group that's evaluating them, it's so many other groups, but I couldn't believe that if this was all true, that PTEC was still being used by the Department of Defense. There's something a little bizarre about all of this. And really, I was beginning to understand unwillingly that the world was was not the way we thought of it. Now, this person that you were discussing this with, Jeff 
Goins. Goins, yeah. W- was he an employee of PTEC? Yes, he was. He's one of the key people at PTEC. He held several important positions. He had traveled to Saudi Arabia and he had met with Yasin Qadi and he had met with most of the investors. He, his last position was vice president of sales, which for a small company is pretty significant. He worked with PTEC helping build the company for five years and he was the one that was based in Virginia who was responsible for getting a lot of the um, government accounts with a of course, um, Osama Ziadi, who was the president. Osama Ziadi is a Lebanese American who, according to Jeff, got a citizenship under very questionable circumstances, which uh, involves the INS. Now, this is all according to Jeff. So at some point later in the week, I had decided to go down to Virginia and meet with not only Jeff, but a number of other PTEC and ex-PTEC employees because this was beginning to sound like a Tom Clancy novel and I needed proof. I told them I needed emails, I needed documents, I needed hard evidence. But in the meantime, within a day or two, I had contacted my rep at IBM and I said, I need to walk outside with you and talk to you about something. If you guys are thinking of getting seriously in bed with this company, I would suggest that you do some background investigation so that your clients like JP Morgan and myself don't end up in the situation. His name was Kyle Hilligos. Kyle told me that he quote unquote wrote a book report and sent it to his legal department and he was told to just back off the whole the whole thing. In fact he would didn't want to have anything to do with me as I continued investigating. Jeff did get the agents at the FBI, the Boston FBI office, to call me back. And with Kyle listening in, so it wasn't just me reporting on what Jeff had said, we spoke to the FBI agent who had picked up the information that Jeff had reported on PTEC when Yasin Qadi was placed on the terror list in October 2001. Remember, this is eight or nine months later. So my question to him is, if you have an investigation that's ongoing, that's fine, and we don't want to get involved with it or impede it in any way. But in the meantime, this country's infrastructure is seriously exposed, and I cannot, if any of this is true, cannot. And I need some some evidence, something that you can give me to to hang my hat on when I report this, that this is true, that this isn't just someone making a terrorism report, you know, um, but that you know that this is true. And and basically what he said is, Indira, you're in a better position on uh, on the outside to get the proof that's needed than I am. And I asked him to check with his supervisor. I said, do you understand how serious this is to have a company with with this alleged terrorism connection at the highest levels of corporate America and the U.S. infrastructure? And I said, if you don't know, I need we need to make you aware of this. He apparently went to a supervisor and supervisor had said that the position wouldn't change. Now, the Boston FBI office, you can check this out, was rated as one of the worst in terms of corruption and I believe the Whitey Bulger incident. The connections between the FBI and and the mafia have been, how should I put it, extremely well explored in the Boston FBI office, the ex-governor of Massachusetts, I believe. Anyway, this mob character, Whitey Bulger's brother, was in a very high-level political position in, in Massachusetts and Boston. And in fact, if people were to read Peter Lance's book, Cover Up, he explores it very well and backs up a lot of what I had found here, the interaction between organized crime and the FBI. So when they said they weren't going to proceed, I... And by they, you're talking about the FBI. The FBI. I said, I need something to hang my hat on. And so he sent me a videotape. And the videotape which I have here, the substance of the videotape was a news clip. It was a news clip of a CBS affiliate based in Boston called WBZ-TV. And their investigative reporting team, the I-team, which was led by investigative reporter Joe Bergantino, had investigated a number of Middle Eastern men who were sought after 9-11. They were affiliated with Muslim Islamic terrorism financing charities. He had created this clip to show the connection between the 9-11 terror attack and the financial vehicles that were supposedly used to fund it. And what he did was very interesting. He connected, the I-team connected Care International, not the big Care International, but something called Care International that was based in Boston, 
all the way back to Al Kifa, which was the financing vehicle at the center of the World Trade Center bombing in 1993, all the way back to something called Maktab Al Kidamat, which means the office, which was a financing vehicle that was set up by the CIA for the Pakistani ISI back in the days when Osama bin Laden was America's fair-haired boy and was on our side fighting with the Mujahideen, fighting the Soviet Union. So the question to me was, my goodness, when I saw the videotape, what is Maktab al Kidamat doing being run out of PTEC on 9-11? And the reason I say being run out of PTEC is that the faces in the videotape were the faces of core employees at PTEC. Now, remember, this is a small company. There were only one or two people who had access to the source code in PTEC, and that is a very trusted position. And he was one of them. His name is Suhail Laher. The people who started Care International, some of them were actually on an FBI terror watch list prior to 9-11 in Boston. What do you mean by the source code? Well, all software products has um, some group or organization or person writes code that is then packaged up and, uh, for instance, the word processor in your desk, the spreadsheet and so on and so forth, the browser is all written in some sort of code. Those are the keys to it. And if you wanted to improve it, add new functionality, you would change the original code and add new functionality and then repackage it and send it out there. So whoever had access to the source code of PTEC, that was where the value was. If you lost the source code, you essentially lost the product for all intents and purposes, marketing point of view. So only one or two people would have access to the source code. It would be like having the formula for Coca-Cola, basically. Now, let's go over that a little bit again. Now, you were talking about the Care International and some other funding groups that have been, what, funding international terrorism. That's correct. And also have been funded by what? The CIA? Well, the original, the roots of um, al Kifa and Care International, if you look at it, were way back in the late 80s, around the time of Iran-Contra, for instance. Maktab al Kidamat was set up so that monies could be passed to um, Osama bin Laden and the Mujahideen when they were fighting the Soviet. Now, I won't go into a lot of detail, but it ended up that Osama bin Laden took that over and was running al-Qaeda through that. The connections to the Pakistani ISI still stood. The connections to the CIA still stood, not in the way that was originally set up, but through a black or a gray operation that had been later confirmed to me. At the end of the day, when I was finished with the certain parts of the investigation, it was clear to me that there's no way PTAC could have done all of this without a lot of inside help. And that's what I began focusing on, that it was a cutout, that it was a front. Was it a regular CIA front? Was it a clandestine front? What was it? You know, there are walls within the FBI, walls within the CIA, behind which these operations take place. And who is behind those operations, you know, is a key question. Now, people might say, oh, this is all conspiracy theory, but I would like to remind people that conspiracy is very much recognized by the United States Federal Code, and it's called RICO, racketeering and influence, and it, it is very much recognized because there's so much power in these organizations that they have rules in place for for instance, the DCIA, the director of CIA, cannot, after his term of DCIA, subsequently run for vice president or president, which is what happened with George Herbert Walker Bush. That rule was bent for him. He went on from being the DCIA to running for vice president. That's a no-no. Well, it sounds like you're describing an interlocking relationship then between this software company funded by Saudis mm -hmm. and funded by whomever, the United States government, U.S. corporations, and then known groups globally that are accused of staging terrorist attacks. Absolutely. It's all of a piece. Yes, absolutely. There, And one of the things I want to say is maybe those organizations don't fully know who their masters are. 
And PTAC is, is the one thread, the one golden thread you pull on. All of this is unraveled because it goes into the corporations. It goes into, um, um, these, uh, government entities. It goes into the terrorism financing entities that were, that none of which have been, oh, by the way, taken to task. And, um, there are just so many questions about what does this all mean? And as we investigated, as I investigated further, we found that the, in the origins of PTEC were very interesting. Where did this company come from? Obviously is, is the first question. And, um, how did they get to be so powerful? Who were the people? Who were the organizations that brought them in? Who knew? Who gave them the power? Who, for instance, signed off Ziadi's Amer- U.S. citizenship without doing background checks? Who said that they had a bad feeling doing that? Uh, I, I remember that PTEC's um, competitors, U.S. companies, were extremely annoyed at the fact that they could not get equal time, that all the plum contracts were going to a foreign-owned company. And I said, well, did you know they were foreign-owned? And if they're foreign-owned, they couldn't get certain classified um, projects. And, and he said, Indira, everyone knew. Some of them, some of the competitors said everyone knew that um, that they were Saudi-owned, and that meant that they got uh, fav- favorable um, treatment on in Capitol Hill. And I said, well, are you saying that um, they just got favored treatment or if there was something more going on, they wouldn't answer. Their lawyers instructed them not to answer. So they knew a lot of what was what was going on. Who, who, who were you talking to about this? Well, in one particular case, I was talking to one of their competitors, um, Popkin Software. And, um, you know, I have no problem naming names because... I think that in the memory of 3,000 U.S. civilians who were, and worldwide civilians who were murdered, if we are going to wage wars and spill blood around the world, we ought to take a look at this and just have the truth come out. Because um, the truth has not come out. It, there's been a lot of speculation, there's been a lot of um, innuendo, but there hasn't been hard proof. And PTEC is the one situation where you can get hard proof. When we investigated PTEC and the people behind it, where they came from, we found out that one of the founding members was a man by the name of Solomon Behari. He was one of the founding directors, and he had put together a vehicle called BMI, which stands for Baitul Mal. Now, BMI was, you know, identified as being involved with terror financing, but this is just not going to be the Muslims hate America. That's not what it is. There is something else going on here. They're being used as a tool, just as the good people of the United States are being used, are being misled into and frightened and terrorized into if we don't wage these horrific wars, you know, our way of life will be over. Who benefits from that? What else did your investigation of P-TECH turn up? Didn't you meet with several employees or former employees of P-TECH? Yes. This goes back to when all of this was being revealed to me. Now, this is the last week of May 2002. The last day or June 1 or so of 2002, lo and behold, out of nowhere, the Chicago FBI enters the picture. We have Agent Robert Wright, the Chicago FBI, who's giving congressional testimony and um, he stands on the steps of the Capitol, bursts into tears, apologizes to the 9-11 families, victims, that he didn't do everything he could to prevent 9-11 from happening, that his investigations were repeatedly shut down. And I almost fell over because he announced that his investigation was the investigation into Yasin Qadi, the same Sheikh Yasin Qadi who was the money man behind PTEC. And um, you could not ask for a more direct connection to 9-11 than that. I will even discount the fact that some XP Tech employees told me that when I went to see them, I presented all the terrorist faces and whatever, and they had indicated that they had seen some pass through P-Tech. In fact, one or two had mentioned that they thought one of the hijackers had actually passed through P-Tech. And I said, did you report this to the FBI? Can you tell me when? Can you get evidence of it? Can you get litigation quality evidence, something that would stand up? Whatever you can get, give it to me. Make copies. Give it to the FBI. I still thought they were on our side. The FBI, you mean? The FBI. In fact, 
and this has to be made very clear, there are some extraordinarily real patriotic Americans and good people in the FBI, as has been said by, I believe, um, Agent Colleen Rowley, one of the FBI whistleblowers, bosses, that there's a wall in the FBI. And this has been validated to me by various attorneys in Houston who are very close to the power bases and are pretty ticked off at what's happening in this country and are speaking out as are many CIA agents who are very concerned that it has gone too far, as are many NSA agents who are concerned that it's gone too far, and FBI agents. So we have a lot of people who are speaking out. They've kept quiet too long. They're afraid. They're afraid of what's happening to this country. And when I say the Third Reich, what is happening to this country, they say, and I will identify they if pressed, they say will make the Third Reich look like a Tea Party. I guess we have that many more billion people to control on this planet. And when you say they say, are you referring to people that you've spoken with in the FBI? Absolutely. Within the FBI, then the CIA. One of the things I didn't want to have happen is that when PTAC was finally raided in December 2002, something that took all of six months, a tremendous amount of agony to have happen, the White House, Ari Fleischer, spun it to find sugar that day. He said, oh, there's nothing wrong. Nothing here, nothing to see here. Everything's fine. So they did a token raid, and that was basically it. But everything that I have done since that time has been for one reason and one reason only, that there may come a time that people will find the trail to PTAC, and it won't be hidden or buried. I've kept it alive whether they renamed their company and moved on, I want to keep the names, the details, everything alive, no matter what I have to do, so that should there come a time for justice and accounting for 9-11 and for what's happening in the world today, it makes it easier for other people to unravel the truth. So I have gone to the mainstream press. I've gone to people on the left, on the left, left, on the right, on the right of right. And I've talked to them face to face and said, this is wrong. Whatever your political inclinations, this is wrong. This is criminal. This is murder. This is worldwide atrocity. And I have reached some very good people on the left and on the right who are willing to speak out about PTAC. I've contacted the alternative press. The alternative press has, like very much like the nine blind men and the elephant, they touch a piece of PTAC, they understand it, and they say, well, this fits my theory of how things went wrong. I have no problem with that because the facts are the facts. If someone wants to spin it to fit their particular viewpoint, for instance, from the wilderness has said that, well, the software that's in PTEC is very much like Promise, the prosecutor's management information system that was has a whole cargo cult behind it of these legendary capabilities. Well, maybe back in the 80s and 90s it was legendary, but today you can do pretty amazing things with software. It's not a big deal. But anyway, from the wilderness and uh, Mike Rupert, for instance, thesis was that Dick Cheney was running an alternate command and control center that day, confusing everyone. And in fact, there were four war games that were going on 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 9-11 and um, who knows why the fighters weren't scrambled in time who knows all this in fact the fighter to Pennsylvania was scrambled in time because we have first-hand proof you know whistleblowers within the correct organizations that that was shot down you know it's just that let's roll was a better story perhaps a story that the american people could handle but no i was told at at ground zero that day we heard them go over and we knew they were shot down we were told it was just later that it we were told well the passengers brought it down well if you're running a country and you're really under terrorist attack that might be the way to go empower people by saying if this bad thing happens to you get up and do something and have a story I really don't have such a big problem with that, but the fact of the matter is it was shut down. Oh, and that's interesting, and you heard that on the day of September 11th. Yes, I did, and it was corroborated a couple of weeks ago by people who were in a particular situation room. Did you want to say anything more about that? uh, Well, it is possible that there was an alternate uh, command and control system that could you technically use PTEC software to do surveillance and intervention? Well, gosh, yes, that's exactly what I was planning on using it for in one of the largest banks in the world. 
It's not a problem. So if someone wants to make it their thesis, I have no problem with that. However, I can't say for sure that that was going on because I don't have direct firsthand you know, knowledge of that. No one has told me and offered me proof of that. But could I state that it could happen? Absolutely, it could have happened. Was it necessary for it to have happened in order for us to have a 9-11? I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe, maybe not. That's not my point. The towers came down, 3,000 people were killed. And what I know is the characters behind the funding of it were totally in bed with characters in the United States, and not only just for 9-11, but going on throughout our nation's history. And the big question is why? What are they up to? Could you describe the relationship of PTEC with the FAA? Now, PTEC worked with the FAA for several years, didn't yes. they? They worked uh, the FAA. There was it was a joint project between PTEC and MITRE, and they were looking at. <laughs> it's interesting. They were looking at basically holes in the FAA's interoperability with uh, responding with other agencies, law enforcement in the case of an emergency such as a hijacking. So they were looking for the escalation process, what people would do, how they would respond in case of an emergency, and find the holes and make recommendations to fix it. Now, if anyone was in a position to understand where the holes were, PTEC was, and that's exactly the point. And if anybody was in a position to write software to take advantage of those holes, it would have been PTEC. Now, was there a reference to PTEC having operated in the basement out of the FAA? Yes. Now, typically, because the scope of such projects are so overarching and wide-ranging, when you are doing an enterprise architecture project, you pretty much have access to how anything in the organization is being done, where it's being done, on what systems, what the information is, and you pretty much have carte blanche. Now, if it's a major project that span several years, the team that comes in has literally access to almost anything that they want because you're operating on a blueprint level on a massive scale. So, yes, they were everywhere. And I was told that they were in places that required clearances. I was told that they had log-on access to uh, FAA flight control computers. I was told that they had passwords to many computers that you may not on the surface think has anything to do with finding out holes in the system. But let's say you've said, okay, you isolated a part of a process of a notification process that was mediated by a computer and you wanted to investigate it further, then you would typically get log on access to that computer. And from that back upstream or downstream, so who knows? You know, from my own experience, I could have access to almost anything I wanted to in J.P. Morgan Chase. And didn't, for the reason I, if anything went wrong, I didn't want to have the access. But if you were up to no good as an enterprise architect with such a mandate, you typically could have anything you wanted, access to anything. What do you think of the claim by the so-called uh, 9-11 Independent Commission and the testimony before it in their mm -hmm. report, the in intelligence agencies didn't know how to talk to each other, what did you think of their so-called report? Um, completely flawed. Governor Kane was the second choice for the head of the commission. I believe Henry Kissinger was the first. Governor Kane had, oh, by the way, done business deals with BMI, Solomon Bahari, PTAC, none of which came out, which he should have volunteered and either recused himself as being a head or a habit of out there in the open. There were three other members of the commission who had similar kinds of um, relationships in the past, and um, they were all on the team. But their findings were so flawed. They're using an excuse Yes, there are, inter there are interoperability communication issues in any organization. Yes, they are. But in the case of an emergency, it doesn't get that bollocked up. Unless, of course, Rupert is right and Cheney was running interference somewhere or someone was running interference or whoever. You know, we don't know. But um, there were four war games, four simulations going on the morning of 9-11. And I just want people to remember that the whole nature of what MITRE 
which is also they develop software for intelligence, which includes the CIA, MITRE, and PTAC, would have, if they were going to test whether they had fixed these holes, would have probably run a simulation. I don't know that they did, but it, that's how we do things. But there were four of them going on. So was there room for confusion? I don't think these people were stupid. I think they were deliberately confused, if anything. Well, we know very well that there was a simulation of the very event taking place during the event, yes. right? Yes, there was. And I believe there's proof there was more than one, just in case the first one didn't confuse people enough. So what does this say? I can be very objective about this and say, well, the terrorists knew that there were war games scheduled for this day and they took advantage of, of it and called 9-11 the particular day. However, we do know that 9-11 had been selected uh, prior. Okay, so then maybe the war games were set many weeks prior for 9-11. And you can play this game over and over and over. Yes, it was the perfect day. And yes, you needed inside knowledge. And yes, PTAC, with all its myriad associations, would have had the inside knowledge. And yes, PTAC was a CIA front. And yes, a PTAC was protected. So was it an inside job? You don't have to look at this indirectly. This is direct. This requires direct investigation. Again, that's a stunning interview jam-packed with incredible information that goes to the very heart of 9-11. And I suggest that people who find this information important and find the controlled corporate media's complete blackout on this information reprehensible do their own part to get this word out by spreading the word about Indira Singh and this breakthrough interview. Remarkably enough, considering the bombshell information provided by this corporate whistleblower, Indira Singh, about this company which actually operated in the basement of the FAA with complete and total access to every operational detail, including their management of interoperability systems with NORAD that could have directly affected the response of NORAD on 9-11. Absolutely nothing has resulted from the FBI investigation of this company and its links to terror. One of the ridiculous PR pieces put out by the Mass High Tech Business Journal comes from Friday, August 22, 2003, and it's entitled Wherewithal, Wrongly Suspected P-Tech CEO Bounce Back Slowly. The article reads in part, Osama Ziad's business has suffered millions in losses this year, none of which can be attributed to a limp economy. His lost millions can be attributed to his devastated professional reputation due to a bogus tip to federal investigators and ensuing bad press. Really bad press. On December 4th, Ziad's business, p -Tech, had been recognized as one of the top 10 companies that matter by KM World for three years running, as well as one of the fastest growing tech companies in New England by Deloitte & Touche. P-Tech is a global supplier of software that helps clients visualize and analyze tech infrastructure and builds models for business planning. Clients include governmental agencies such as the FBI, the IRS, the Federal Aviation Administration, and the Secret Service. Business was good until December 5th, when P-Tech was visited by federal investigators acting on a tip that a company investor had links to Al-Qaeda and that P-Tech may have designed a back door in its software, allowing terrorist entry to the above-named client's databases. Ziad cooperated, saying he had nothing to hide, while the government took measures to come late at night, in the hope that its visit would be stealthy. It wasn't. The following day, Ziad opened the newspaper and saw his photo next to a story describing a raid on P-Tech to investigate possible terrorist links. He became really scared. It was a nightmare, I took my family out of the house immediately, he says. I thought, what if someone comes to my house? I was in a bad situation. It would be 30 days before he'd sleep through the night. In the meantime, he had to lay off a dozen employees, because in the following two months, business fell off by $3 million. It seemed many customers didn't want to do business with a perceived terrorist sympathizer, while those who knew P-Tech and its founder extended kindness. By March, things started to get a little better. Word came directly from the White House, making official what the feds thought all along, that there is no terrorist connection to P-Tech, 
nor was there ever any backdoor in the software. End quote. Again, that incredible, mindless whitewash article, which provides no evidence whatsoever about the very real links of top P-Tech investors to terrorist organizations, was run in Mass High Tech Business Journal in 2003. Just how ridiculous that whitewash is becomes clear in an excellent article from FrontPageMagazine.com called The Business of Terror by Dr. Rachel Ehrenfeld. Quote, On May 11, 2005, Muhammad Mubayed was arrested and charged in Boston's district court for filing false tax returns on behalf of Care International, for which he acted as treasurer. Mubayed was also the customer services manager of the company known as P-Tech, a privately owned technology company based in Quincy, Massachusetts. P-Tech, which recently changed its name to Go Agile, developed a software, also called P-Tech, that was used primarily to develop enterprise blueprints that held every important functional, operational, and technical detail of a given enterprise. Mubayad is only the latest of P-Tech's top investors and managers to run afoul with the law. Mubayad personifies the interlinks of the complex infrastructure which were established by Al-Qaeda and other Islamist organizations in the U.S. But Mubayad was not arrested for his connection with Al-Qaeda. Rather, he was charged for making false statements and conspiring to defraud the U.S. by misrepresenting CARE's activities, which involved the solicitation and expenditure of funds to support and promote the Mujahideen and Jihad, including the distribution of pro-Jihad publications. CARE International is the now-defunct Muslim charity that was originally the Boston branch office of the al Khaifa Refugee Center in Brooklyn, New York from which Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman funded and plotted the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Care International was already publicly identified as supporting Al-Qaeda back in 2002, yet it remained open, and several of its employees worked and or were affiliated with P-Tech. P-Tech was raided by the FBI on December 6, 2002, following a tip from an employee who suspected that the company was connected to the 9-11 attacks. Indeed, on October 12, 2001, Yassin Al-Qadi, P-Tech's top investor at that time, was listed by the U.S. government as a specially designated global terrorist for his support of Al-Qaeda. Al-Qadi invested at least $18 million directly in P-Tech, $5 million through the Isle of Man, and $9 million indirectly through BMI, a now-defunct New Jersey-based Islamic investment firm with connections to other members on P-Tech's management and investors. Al-Qadi also transferred two million U.S. dollars to P-Tech from Switzerland between 1997 and 2000, according to Swiss investigators. Al-Qadi's businesses extended throughout the world and included banking, diamonds, chemicals, construction, transportation, and real estate. It would be hard to find a more strategically placed individual to advance the agenda of Al-Qaeda or any other terrorist organization. Qadi is still at large, and according to recent media reports, expanding his business in Asia. The identities and connections of some other P-Tech investors and managers should have also raised a red flag. Even P-Tech removed from its website the names of several board members and or their affiliations after a Wall Street Journal expose on December 6, 2002. End quote. All of that carefully researched article is backed up by another article, also incredibly well researched and definitely worth looking into, from the AmericanMonitor.com. This article is from January 16, 2007, and is headlined P Tech Owners' Assets Confiscated in Albania. It reads in part quote, The Albanian government has seized the assets of a wealthy Saudi that, for several years, reportedly maintained simultaneous connections to both Al-Qaeda and the U.S. government while serving the interests of the CIA. The finance ministry said it ordered authorities to block four apartments, a house, four bars and shops, and more than two hectares, about five acres of land, belonging to Yasin Al-Qadi, the Associated Press reports, citing the official Gazette. Yasin Al-Qadi, the owner of the property according to the U.S. Treasury Department, heads the Saudi-based Muwafaq Foundation, an al-Qaeda front that receives funding from wealthy Saudi businessmen. 
The Treasury has thus identified the prominent entrepreneur as a specially designated global terrorist. Despite his alleged affiliations to terrorism, Al Qadi has maintained concurrent contacts within influential Washington circles. In fact, prior to being publicly connected to money laundering and terrorist financing, Al Qadi regularly spoke of his relationship with Vice President Dick Cheney. Al Qadi, who has been identified as one of Osama bin Laden's chief money launderers, owned a prominent U.S. technology firm and alleged CIA front known as PTEC. He also escorted U.S. officials around during their visits to Saudi Arabia. As reported by the Associated Press, Al Qadi allegedly worked with Osama bin Laden to provide support to terrorist networks in Albania, prompting the recent confiscation of his assets in that country. According to the Associated Press, Al Qadi used six different names for the recently seized assets, all of which were in the Tirana area, Albania's capital city. One charity to allegedly launder money in Albania for the Al Qaeda network was Yasin Al Qadi's Muwafaq Foundation. Khalid bin Mafuz, an extremely influential and wealthy Saudi who established and funded the Muwafaq Foundation, was once the principal shareholder and director of BCCI, a criminal enterprise used by the CIA during the 1980s to funnel cash to Osama bin Laden for the anti-Soviet jihad in Afghanistan. As former DEA undercover agent Michael Levine explained to The New American in 1999, the U.S. armed and funded the worst elements of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, drug traffickers, armed smugglers, anti-American terrorists. We later paid the price when the World Trade Center was bombed in 1993, and we learned that some of those responsible had been trained by us. Now we're doing the same thing with the KLA. These guys, Levine said, referring to the KLA, have a network that's active on the streets of this country. They're the worst elements of society that you can imagine, and now, according to my sources in drug enforcement, they're politically protected. According to Yusef Bodansky, director of research of the International Strategic Studies Association, the role of the Albanian mafia, which is tightly connected to the KLA, is laundering money, providing technology, safe houses, and other supports to terrorists within this country. In any case, Bodansky told the New American, a serious investigation of the Albanian mob isn't going to happen because they're our boys. They're protected. This may help explain why, according to FBI whistleblower Robert Wright, his investigation into Yasin al Qadi during the 1990s was intentionally and repeatedly thwarted and obstructed by higher-ups at the FBI. According to Agent Wright, who seized $1.4 million directly linked to al-Qaeda in 1998, FBI intelligence agents lied and hid vital records from criminal agents for the purpose of obstructing his criminal investigation of the terrorists in order to protect their subjects and prolong their intelligence operations, as reported by the group questioning Wright, Judicial Watch. The supervisor who was there from headquarters was right straight across from me and started yelling at me, you will not open criminal investigations. I forbid any of you, you will not open criminal investigations against any of these intelligence subjects, Agent Wright told ABC News in 2002. According to Agent Wright and other members of his former unit, the money trails of the 1998 African embassy bombings led back to al Qadi, but even after the bombings, FBI headquarters wanted no arrests. According to Agent Wright, it is very likely that 9-11 would have been prevented if he had simply been allowed to do his job. End quote. Again, the importance of all of this information cannot be underestimated. Special Agent Robert Wright said he was investigating a company with 26 subsidiaries, and when he was referring to that, he was referring to BMI, the larger organization which had PTEC as one of the jewels in its crown. And it later came out that the head of the 9-11 Commission... Governor Kane actually sold a piece of property in New Jersey through BMI Inc. What does it mean that Robert Wright's investigation into BMI and PTEC and the global terrorist financiers was shut down and that the person who was appointed to head the 9-11 Commission after Kissinger didn't make the grade with the 9-11 victims' family members actually had dealings with that company? 
For more information on that, please look into FBI agent Robert Wright and the claims that he made in September 2002 that the FBI was continuing to protect terrorists from criminal investigations. And for even more information on the cover-up, I suggest an article entitled Michael Chertov and the Sabotage of the P-TECH Investigation, which details how Chertov was involved in a turf war with the FBI for control over Operation GreenQuest. The Special Customs Investigation Force, which Indira Singh cited in that interview with Bonnie Faulkner, that was charged with finding and tracking down international sources of funding for global terrorists. Perhaps it's no surprise and no coincidence that after Chertoff gained control of Operation GreenQuest, it became completely ineffectual, as evidenced by an article on the counterterrorism blog by Christopher Heffelfinger called Operation GreenQuest Unresolved, which notes that this massive multi-agency initiative has not yet yielded any convictions, and that was as of October 2007. For those wondering what's happened to Indira Singh since 2005, well, you might want to join the club. She has gone underground in the last three years, presumably as a way of staying safe, while she continues to research and write her book, about the P-TECH investigation and the various links that she has uncovered through that investigation. She has recently resurfaced, however, to write a memorial to Michael Corbin, a radio talk show host who has interviewed Indira Singh before and who died under mysterious circumstances in March of this year. I direct listeners again to the documentation list for this episode from which they can find a link to Indira Singh's memorial to Michael Corbin, and also to the interviews that Michael Corbin conducted with Indira Singh, in which she goes even further into naming the names behind p and her investigations into the global terrorist financing ring. Again, this is the deep research which really will expose those people who had a hand in not only perpetrating, but in then covering up the attacks of 9-11, and the sophisticated enterprise architecture, that software that they used to help bring those attacks about. It's my hope that this episode of the Corbett Report does not present all of the answers to what happened on 9-11 in one neat little package, but I do hope that it presents enough information to get you thinking and get you started on your own research. It's only by the collective efforts of a community united in a common cause of exposing the real culprits of 9-11 that we can ever hope to achieve 9-11 justice. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report Subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.